I just upgraded to the new M1 MacBook Air base model for all my photography needs. But is it good enough? Let's just find out. What is happening people? My name is Gaurav and I'm a travel and a wedding photographer based in Birmingham, England. So these new MacBooks were released at the end of last year and after watching tons and tons of reviews, I finally decided to give in and buy one for myself. Just to clarify, I purchased an entry level model, the 256 gigabytes and eight gigabytes RAM. Surprisingly, I managed to pick it up for about 619 pounds, so about 620 pounds. And this is only because I traded in my 15 inch MacBook Pro for 380 pounds, which I purchased at the end of 2008. 15. So it's not a bad deal, right? If you're looking to do the same, I recommend you take advantage of Apple's trading scheme because you'll be surprised how much money you could save. Like I said, the MacBook I traded in was a late 2015 model and I managed to get £380 for it. Anyway, so why did I move from the MacBook Pro to the MacBook Air. So one of the reasons was that my MacBook Pro could no longer handle Adobe Lightroom Classic without sounding like a Formula One car. I mean, it got to a stage where I was on a flight and somebody sitting next to me would look at me thinking, is that thing going to be all right? And the second reason is because of the new M1 chip that's inside the MacBook Air. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail because that plays a crucial part as to why I really purchased the MacBook Air and not the MacBook Pro. This MacBook Air is totally silent because there's no fans inside to cool the chip and it doesn't require any fans to cool the chip whereas the MacBook Pro the M1 MacBook Pro the new one has fans this means it can perform marginally better than this MacBook Air I mean the difference is negligible it's not night and day I've seen all the reviews I've watched hundreds of videos on YouTube about this and I finally made the choice to go for the MacBook Air because it's thin light and it's great for travel so what is the M1 chip the M1 chip or the processor whatever you want to call it is designed by Apple and so are the MacBook machines to put it simply these chips use the same technology as the chips inside the iPad or the iPhone traditionally a lot of the computers use separate chips for like CPU storage and RAM what the M1 chip does is it combines all that in one place as opposed to separate chips and easier and faster for the CPU to handle all the tasks because it's all in one place. This also means there's less energy consumption, which brings us to the battery life. Generally, when you see the tech specs on the manufacturer's website, you expect them to over exaggerate the specs. For example, the battery life, but on these laptops I found, it, they've kind of understated the battery life. For example, when I got the MacBook Air, it was at 80% battery life. After installing all the apps, all the editing software, everything I needed to install, using it for a couple of hours to edit photos, I still had 20% of battery life left. Now to me, that is mind blowing, especially when I got used to using my previous MacBook Pro for about two to three hours maximum and having to recharge it again after that. So after that, I charged it overnight to make sure it was 100%. The next day, I watched a few YouTube videos, modified my website a little bit, and wrote a few YouTube scripts, and the battery life only went down 20% to 80%. On average, from editing on this MacBook Pro, I say I'd get about eight hours of good usage. That's good, solid editing which is absolutely amazing. I don't know whether I was impressed with the battery life because my previous MacBook was old or this one is simply just amazing. If you're looking for a computer and not having to worry about charging it for a whole day, this is the machine for you. And having said that, it's going to be great for long flights because I can't see myself using it for eight hours straight without having to go to sleep on a long flight. Whereas previously trying to find a working plug socket on a long flight was always an issue. The other thing I really like about this is the instant on feature. Every time I lift up the lid for this laptop, it's always on. I mean, it's hard to explain, but when you get used to something like this and you use somebody else's laptop, you realize that their laptop takes a while for the screen to actually come on. And even that fraction of a second can make a difference. I know it seems petty, but you do notice it. With regards to the design of this machine, I always like the design of the MacBook Air, but I just couldn't justify it because I just knew it wasn't powerful enough. Not as powerful as a MacBook Pro anyway. Here it is. I went and actually put a skin on top of mine because I quite like that. It kind of personalizes it and I've put my website and uh, my Instagram at the top with my email. 
I should have really put my YouTube channel on there as kind of a missed opportunity. These are my images of course taken on my travels and if you want your images on your machine I'll leave a link in the description below of the website where I got this done from. I really really thought I would struggle with the size of this because my previous MacBook was a 15 inch screen and this one is a 13.3 inch screen however I haven't found it a problem because there's certain adjustments I can make in apps like Adobe Lightroom Classic to get more real estate from the screen. So I quickly got used to the 13 inch screen and it's not been a problem whatsoever even coming from a 15 inch screen the other great thing about the screen is it's still a retina screen so i get plenty of pixels to edit my photos exactly how i want to and it's got a true tone display sensor built in which means it can adjust the screen white balance according to the ambient temperature around you to display the correct image I've turned this setting off because I've actually calibrated my screen with a professional calibrator and I'll leave a link in the description below for the calibrator I used if you want to check it out. One of my only concerns was that this MacBook doesn't have many ports as my MacBook Pro 15 inch did but I quickly got around that because I found one of these things. This plugs in at the side of your MacBook and gives you plenty of options like two USB A ports, two USB C ports a memory card reader and a HDMI port. Having said that, I've not had the need to use it at all and I really, really thought I would, but I haven't because I already have a Samsung solid state drive, which I discussed in one of my previous videos and that is USB-C compatible. And I'll leave a link to both of these things in the description below if you wanna check them out. The reason why I recommend the Samsung SSD also is because it's very, very high speed and it's very compatible with this machine. And it's another reason why I went for the 256 gigabyte MacBook Air model as opposed to to the 512 or even one gigabyte model because I can just plug this SSD in and have my data stored on a separate hard drive as opposed to the laptop itself. And the other thing is if anything was to go wrong with the laptop, I know all my data is secured on a separate drive. And that's the other reason I recommend this solid state drive. The keyboard for this laptop is nice, sturdy and clicky. It feels more sturdy and responsive as opposed to my 15 inch MacBook Pro. Although I did like the travel on the keys for my MacBook Pro, this one is more clicky, which isn't a problem. It just means it's more responsive, that's all. The trackpad for this thing is large and personally I find it annoying because it gives you less space for the size of the machine it is to rest your palms on to type on the keyboard. The other thing I didn't like is because the trackpad is so large you have to move your hand around a lot more to get from one side of the screen to the other but to get around that just turn the mouse sensitivity up so you don't have to use the full trackpad and it was eventually all right. Again, you gotta remember I'm coming from a 15 inch MacBook Pro, which was a 2015 model, and the trackpad on that wasn't large, and the machine itself was bigger than the 13 inch. So let's just get to the good stuff. After installing all the photography apps on this machine, I was still left with 156 gigabytes of storage, which is quite impressive to be honest. And remember, I'm not planning to keep any of the data on the machine itself anyway. And even if I was, I think I'll have enough space to shoot a wedding and back up the photos on the laptop's hard drive. What I did find really disappointing is that Lightroom Classic, which most professional photographers use, still isn't compatible natively with the M1 MacBooks. Now what that means is Adobe Lightroom Classic isn't utilizing the M1 chip to its full potential. Let me explain a little bit more. The M1 MacBooks run a piece of software called Rosetta 2. Rosetta 2 is designed by Apple. It's so that software like Adobe Lightroom Classic that's been designed for the Intel based machines can be translated to run on the M1 machines. This means that a lot of the software that you used to be able to run on the Intel based MacBook machines can be translated through the Rosetta 2 software can also be run on M1 machines. Having said that, Lightroom Classic isn't bad on this machine. I've just known it to run better before I updated the operating system to the latest Mac OS on my previous MacBook Pro. I'm not talking about rendering all the photos. If I'm rendering the photos, I can always go away and come back and it will be done. Two to three minutes extra for exporting the photos isn't a problem for me because I can always go away, make a coffee and come back and it'll be ready. However, what is a problem is when I'm editing the photos and there's a delay of previewing the before and after. That's what's happening right now. It's not hugely impactful, but I have noticed a difference between my previous machine and this one. And things like copying and pasting settings from one image to another in Adobe Lightroom Classic, that can be delayed by a couple of seconds. Again, totally usable. But if you're speed editing, it can get a little annoying. Apart from that, everything runs bodily smooth. I even plugged my Wacom tablet in and it's absolutely fine. There's no issues with it whatsoever. I know Adobe Lightroom, not Adobe Lightroom Classic. Adobe Lightroom is compatible with the M1 chip, but 
a lot of professionals like myself, I do use Adobe Lightroom Classic and I really can't wait for Adobe to make that natively compatible with the M1 chip because the performance will skyrocket. On the other hand, Photoshop is amazing. I haven't had any issues with Photoshop at all. That is compatible with the M1 chip natively. I have installed all these other apps as well. I haven't seen any issues with them, although some of these aren't compatible with the M1 chip and it is using the Rosetta 2 software as emulation. I haven't seen any performance issues with these apps at all. So the question is, should you buy a MacBook Air. Regardless of the Lightroom Classic issues, I would definitely recommend this if you're a photographer and you're looking for an upgrade of a laptop. Definitely, definitely, definitely consider the base model. You don't have to spend a lot of money and if you're trading like I did, you can get a lot of money off. So I'm going to leave it here for this video guys and I just want to thank everybody for staying till the end. If you have any photography related questions that you want answering about this machine, then also drop me a comment below. Having said that, if you did enjoy this video, do go and hit the thumbs up button and that will help the YouTube algorithm promote this video up the ranks so other people can benefit from this knowledge. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.